Welcome to the Ray White Mayor Gambia Property Management Investment Seminar. The reason this event came about was that our team continues to get questions, uh, some of which we can answer, others are a little bit beyond our scope. We thought we would do the right thing by the wider community and get experts in the field to deliver um, their information um, on a really cool platform. I love that we are able to deliver such an innovative event to the wider community and it's so exciting to see the team so thoroughly enjoying the process and being excited by this opportunity for our wider community and our landlords and clients as well. We hope that you take something from this event, whether it be new information or a new connection that you've made uh, and we certainly look forward to hearing from you soon. Firstly, we acknowledge the land we meet on today is the traditional land of the Bowen Dick people and we respect their spiritual relationships with country. We acknowledge the Bowen Dick people as the traditional custodians of the region and we pay our respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Ray White Met Gambia's first ever property management investment seminar. My name is Hayley Goodwin. I'm the Client Service Manager here at Ray White Met Gambia and I'll be your host this evening. Myself and the entire team are excited to have you here. The reason this initiative and was born was not only to provide better value and support to our own clients, but the wider community as well. We endeavour to be the experts in the industry and continually learn, develop and grow, which allows us a stronger resource for everyone. We wanted to provide additional value and beneficial information to our wider community, no matter what level of experience within the property market. Just some small housekeeping before we get started. The Wollanda Centre is a no smoking, smoking and vaping area. The toilets are located to the right hand side. We have refreshments and food available um, and there'll be time later on this evening uh, for a Q&A for any questions you may have for our speakers. You'll find a pen and a notepad in your goodie bags if you want to take any notes. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, Nerida Connersby. We are thrilled to have her here with us tonight. She's one of Australia's leading property experts and has more than 20 years of property experience. You may have seen her frequently providing commentary to Australia's Financial Review, Bloomberg, ABC, or even The Seven Network. Please welcome Ray White's Chief Economist, Nera Connersby, to the stage. Uh, so good to be here tonight. Um, there's three reasons I'm really happy to be here. Uh, the first is my mum went to Millicent High School and uh, lived in Mount Burr for many years, so I was able to bring my mum here, here um, to the southeast of South Australia. The second is I love working with Talia and her team because <laughs> they, they really are such high energy and, and such great people to work with. And the third is that it is, it is really a, quite an interesting market here at the moment. Uh, last year, uh, the southeast of South Australia saw the strongest price growth in Australia. Um, surprising, you know, you may think, but um, the rest of Australia was going through a quite significant downturn in pricing with all those interest rate rises. But here in the southeast, we did continue to see price growth. So lots of positivity here, lots of people moving here. The pandemic really has um, changed the way people look at regional Australia. Uh, and it's certainly, um, there's a lot to be positive about and the positivities extend from agriculture to tourism to um, you know the, just very just a whole different parts of the economy that's that's really creating a lot of activity. So today I'm just going to run you through um, what's happening here in the southeast. I will start with a, a bit of an economic overview to, to tell you what's happening. I won't I won't be too boring. I promise when I when I give you that um, overview. Um, but what we have found um, in Australia is that, is that those, all those interest rate rises are now leading to uh, a slowing of the economy. So the economy went into recession very, very brief, briefly at the start of, um, of the pandemic. Uh, we came out of there really quickly as we all started to spend again. Uh, and then we had those interest rate rises that, that have started to, to really slow things down. So 
One of the positives is that we do have very, very low unemployment at the moment. So people are paying more, inflation has been high, people are paying more on their rents and their mortgages and, and pretty much for everything. Uh, but at the same time, everyone, you know, not everyone, but almost everyone has a job. And we've got this very, very low unemployment level, the lowest level in, in around 50 years. So some positivity there. More negatively though, um, there is a lot of problems with inflation. So. Um, we were always expected to see inflation uh, hit these really high levels as we came out of the pandemic. Uh, the problem has been is that it has remained far higher for far longer than, than was expected. And as a result, we've had the Reserve Bank increasing interest rates very, very rapidly. So anyone with a mortgage um, is, is feeling pretty stressed right now. I've got a mortgage, as you know, I've, I live in Sydney. House prices are extreme there, so it is very stressful for people. And as a result, it, is, it, it did create uh, quite significant downturns in, in many parts of Australia. So Sydney in particular, Melbourne, um, not so much Adelaide. Adelaide pricing did remain, it did come back a little bit, but not much. But in our most expensive cities, we did see this quite dramatic downturn in, in house prices. Uh, a big problem at the moment is that construction costs are very high. So um, when we have a look at what's driving inflation, a, a lot of what's driving it is, has come back. So fuel prices have started to come back. Uh, a lot of the supply chain issues have started to become a lot better, but construction costs are very, very expensive at the moment. So it's very hard for people to get labour. It's very hard to get raw materials. A lot of things, you know, were stuck overseas, really hard to get them into, into the country. Uh, it is starting to improve, but again, we, we are seeing an improvement in a lot of materials costs, but we're not, we're not seeing the same improvement in labour costs. So labour does remain very, very expensive, particularly for trades. So here in South Australia, we do have a problem trying to build enough homes. It's very difficult to get um, the number of homes required. So even though the economy is doing well, people want to live here, um, there just aren't enough places for them to, to live. And as a, as a result, we have seen very extreme growth in rents. Um, great for investors, obviously, when you're an investor and you, you do have rental growth on your property, it is very good. Um, but obviously challenging for renters. And that's also flown through to house price growth as well. Uh, we've got lots of migration here to South Australia. So you can see there that really the last 20 years, um, we did see a lot of interstate migration out of the state. Um, that has changed over, over the COVID period. It really did change. So uh, we did see a lot of people moving to South Australia during the pandemic. I don't know how they got here because it was really hard to get into South Australia, but you know they must have found ways, uh, ways to move in. Uh, but that's continued. And it, last year, South Australia was actually the strongest growth economy in percentage terms in Australia. So a lot to do with the population growth that was occurring, a lot to do with some really good agricultural conditions. And um, for any of you involved in agriculture in this part of Australia, we would have you know, likely have felt um, some of the benefits that occurred during that time. Um, the other thing that is driving it too is, is overseas migration. So again, historically, Adelaide, um, you know, it, has, it hasn't been the city that has, or sorry, South Australia hasn't been the state that has attracted the, the bulk of overseas migration. That continues to be the case. People do tend to land in Sydney and, Mel Sydney and Melbourne first. But um, as you can see there from that yellow line, it has really picked up. You know, that we're, we're not only seeing a lot of people moving from interstate, uh, to South Australia, we're also seeing a lot of uh, people moving from overseas as well. So there has been a real shift uh, in the economy as to, to how people perceive it and also the job opportunities. Uh, looking at population growth, um, South Australia saw around 25,000 um, population growth. So obviously it's not as much as what we saw in, in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. They are a lot bigger. Um, but in percentage terms, it's, it's pretty significant. It's also significant because when you consider how many houses are required per annum at the moment in the state, so 25,000 additional people uh, means we roughly need sort of eight to 10,000 homes per year. And at the same time, we just haven't seen very many homes constructed. So, that, you know, when we look at what's happening in the market with, with rental growth and price growth, uh, a lot of it has to do with this imbalance that we've seen between the number of people who are moving here and just not enough homes that are available for them. 
So looking at pricing, um, I mentioned at the start that the southeast of South Australia did see the strongest, pop uh, strongest price growth last year at a time when we were seeing a national slowdown in, in prices. Uh, but really from, from that chart, you can see what happened during the pandemic, that we did see a complete reset in, in pricing in this part of, of Australia. And it was interesting just talking earlier that, um, you know, pricing for, for, I mean, there's houses selling in Mount Gambier for over a million dollars now. And, you know, I, I think before the pandemic, so, you know, considering something like that happening was, was considered, um, you know, something that would, you know, not never happen, but something that would not happen for quite some time. But the pandemic really did shift um, what we saw with prices. So anyone who bought in 2020, you probably, um, I hope you're feeling pretty happy at the moment. And you may maybe not be that happy with your mortgage payments. That's a, another issue, but, but certainly, in terms of capital growth for your property, it has been particularly positive and also rental growth as well. So it has been a, a very good part of Australia to invest in over the last couple of years. Um, the big challenge now, if you are looking to buy properties, that there's just not many properties available on the market. So I've been talking a lot about housing supply today and that's how new homes. Um, but we also have a shortage of um, existing homes for sale. So, and this is something we're seeing across Australia. We're not seeing many people come to market. People are a little bit uncertain about the outlook. Um, we do find most people that sell are subsequent buyers, you know, so they're a little bit uncertain. Um, but you can see there from that chart, you know, we've got this national slowdown, but here in the southeast, it's actually the biggest decline in South Australia. So people are holding on to properties. Um, a lot of people have done very well over, over the last five or so years. Uh, they're not selling. Um, and, and as a result, that's also keeping prices far more elevated than they otherwise would. When we see markets where transactions a lot of transactions take place. We, you know, we, we do tend to, to see pricing look a little bit different. So here at the moment, uh, a shortage of properties for sale is, is quite challenging for people trying to get into the market. Um, on to rents, um, very, very strong growth in rents. So we don't have, a, we don't have rental growth um, specifically for the southeast of South Australia. I've got some suburb level data, which I'll show in a sec. But um, again, you can see there that particularly for houses, we have seen this enormous pickup in, in rental, um, rental levels. And the thing about rents is this isn't going to stop. You know, what we're seeing across Australia at the moment is that rents have moved very, very quickly over a short period of time. And there's, there's lots of reasons for it, but fundamentally it's because we're, we're not building enough homes and we're, we've got a lot of population growth. Um, but that's not going to change. You know, we're not seeing either of those things changing anytime soon. So at the moment, rents do look like they're going to continue to grow. And as I mentioned earlier, it is obviously great if you are someone that is investing in property because, um, you know, we know most people invest in property for capital growth. That, you know, that does seem, it seem to be something that, that is quite uh, apparent with Australian property investors. But obviously, if you get a rental yield where you can, you know, use that to pay off the majority of your loan, it does make it a far better investment decision than, than if you're unable to do that. Um, and on to yields, um, we are starting to see quite, quite you know, some, a steady pickup in what yields are being achieved in property in, in regional South Australia. Um, the black line is very scribbly and um, you probably need to be a little bit cautious looking at it because it's apartments and we don't have many apartments in, in regional South Australia. So the, the time series does tend to get, get a bit out of out of line, but um, if you have a look at the yellow line, you can see there that we did see a drop in um, in yields, property yields, um, but they're starting to pick up again, primarily because we're seeing such rent, such strong rental growth uh, occurring over the, over the past 12 to 18 months. Um, just on to finance, so I know after this we've got a panel um, with with some people that will be talking around finance, um, which which will be great. You know, I think that's such an important thing to structure loans appropriately and you know get the right loan. But one of the things that we we have seen it it is more difficult to get a home loan at the moment, and what we've seen is this really big drop. Uh, across the state in the number of home loans being approved. So these are home loans for new properties. Um, 11 interest rate rises has made it far more difficult to get a home loan, so that, so that may, has made a difference. 
Um, but also that, as I mentioned before, there just isn't many properties to buy. So, you know, that's been another factor leading to that decline. Um, so number of new homes has dropped, um, new home loans has dropped, but really what we are seeing is this incredible pickup in refinancing. So it is a good time to refinance if you, if you need to. Um, there are some really competitive deals out there and, um, you know, and banks are obviously always keen to, to get new business. So this has been something that people across, um, across the state have been very active in doing and, and even to hit that level, that record level of refinancing is, is quite incredible, the, the degree at which people have taken up that opportunity. Uh, and then first home buyers are slowly returning. So I don't know if we've got any first home buyers here tonight, but it's actually not a bad market for first home buyers if you don't think of finance. The finance issues are very, very difficult. But um, first home buyers now have got um, this been an extension of the first home buyer uh, scheme. That's a national scheme uh, where you can get a five percent deposit. No, sorry, you can get a loan with a five percent deposit and not pay mortgage insurance. So you know that's been a good scheme. Uh, and then there's various state government schemes that, are, that also tend to come and go, which are also worth a look at. So definitely, you know, I, I always, I know this is, an, this is an investor seminar, not a first home buyer seminar, but, you know, I always encourage people to buy a first home because uh, it is such an important step to creating wealth and at retirement does put you in a very different position to someone that doesn't own a home. So now just a bit of a, a bit more of a focus on, on this part of Australia and just having a look at some of the suburbs over the past 12 months where we have seen quite a pick up in pricing. Um, they do tend to be, you know, Beachport and Robe are obviously, um, there would be a lot of people, you know, perhaps buying holiday homes. I know Robe has vastly changed over the last, you know, 10, 20 years and has become very, very expensive. The median is, is now well over 600,000. Um, but then you've also got Narra Court and Mount Gambia have also seen some really decent price growth. So keep in mind, um, you know, this is during a time when it was, it has been one of the worst downturns we've seen in quite some time. So Sydney house prices, we've seen some suburbs drop by 10, 15, 20% over this time period. But here in, in this part of, of Australia, in the southeast of South Australia, uh, we are continuing to see price growth. So a lot to do, you know, even though interest rates are high, a lot to do with what's been changing in, in the local economy and what's been changing um, with regard to the attractiveness of this area. Um, we are seeing some suburbs that, or some towns that are seeing in decline in prices. Um, I don't know these areas, um, but you know, you can see there, there's only, I think, three suburbs where we have seen a decline in prices. So, um, you know, which again is, is quite unusual when you consider that, that this is a period where we, we have seen some, some really widespread falls in prices over that time period. Uh, on to rents. Um, King, so Mount Gambia up $40 a week over the past year. Um, Millicent up $30, $30 a week. Kingston is, is topping the list. So, um, you know, beachside area. So perhaps that's something that's, that's really driving it. Um, Border Town, you know, it, has, it is relatively slow growth over, over the past year for, for prices, but has picked up in rentals. So, you know, so it's again some real positivity in terms of what's been happening to rental growth in the state, which is, um, which is oh, sorry, in this region, which is, which is great for, for if you've got an investment property. Now, this is a little bit controversial, completely out controversial. Um, so we've, what we do when we look at most expensive streets, we, we do have to rely on um, sales happening in the street. So um, I know talking to Talia before, she's like, oh, look, I'm sorry, your list isn't quite right because it's probably Bay Street, Bay Road. And I went down Bay Road today and I'm like, it's very nice here. So I can see why that is a very expensive street. Um, but the problem with Bay Road, I mean, there's, not, there's no problem with Bay Road, but the, the challenge for us with Bay Road is that people buy properties there and then they don't sell them. <laughs> so we just don't get enough transactions taking place for us to, to get a clear idea as, as to what's happening. So um, we do limit this analysis to three sales per year, but, you know, tightly held streets and short streets just don't come up. So 
Um, based on that analysis, um, Hilltop Avenue, Mount Gambier, which I understand is quite a lot of new properties, um, does come up as our, as our most expense, expensive street in Mount Gambier. Um, most affordable, um, still some quite affordable areas here. Um, but you know it is you know we as I mentioned before we we are starting to see prices really push up, even at at the cheaper end of town. That trying to find a property here for two hundred thousand I think would be pretty difficult um, to find in in Mount Gambier. So I'm going to finish off with um, a little bit of regret for those of you that were looking at Robe twenty years ago because it was super cheap. You could have bought something for you know well under two hundred thousand. It's now sitting at six thirty. So that has been the strongest performer. Obviously, partly because people over the past twenty years there has been this real shift of people wanting uh, to go beachside, and, and you know that's been apparent for people where they want to live and where they want to holiday. And and Robe obviously um, is a great place for people to holiday. So holiday home demand has been a factor. Um, but what I think is also really um, important that not all of the top suburbs are beachside suburbs. That you've also got there Mount Gambier and Narracourt, which um, have also seen some, you know, pretty decent increases over the past 20 years. So um, a lot of positivity, um, and also that a lot of that price growth did did occur over the past five years. So you know there was quite a period of time when where not much happened. So there has been such a significant change. So I'm going to finish up there and I think we're going to get the panel. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Nerida. Our next guest speaker is the owner and general manager of Eckermann's Conveyances. He is continually striving to lead the industry in terms of technology and client service delivery. He is passionate about the conveyancing profession and is a vice president of the Division Council of the Australian Institute of Conveyances here in SA. Please welcome Brad Eckerman. Thank you very much and I want to thank uh, Talia and her team uh, very much for uh, the opportunity to speak um, tonight and congratulations Talia, it's an uh, amazing turnout, so well done. I've got the exciting um, subject of conveyancing after Nerida talking about property prices and uh, our other um, presenters tonight talking about much more exciting things than conveyancing but um, we are a necessity um, to buying or selling property so um, if you are buying or selling anytime soon you will need uh, one of us. Um, so um, we are an, in, an important part of the process because we help you get your property or we help you get your money if you're selling. Uh, and we obviously transfer uh, the property into your name. So conveyancing is an important part. I'm here with my uh, learned colleague Andrew in the back corner there. Um, uh, what we don't know about conveyancing isn't worth knowing, is that right Andrea? Um, so come and speak to us in the break or afterwards if you need to um, ask any conveyancing questions. So. When Talia asked me to do this, I thought, what's exciting and what won't put the um, group to sleep um, about conveyancing, especially after after Nerida talking about property price rises, etc. I've tried to come up with something that um, will keep you awake, and I'll be as brief as I can because I know there's some other very good speakers coming. Um, as Nerida said before, unfortunately, grants are very few and far between at the moment. Um, there is that first home buyer uh, deposit guarantee um, that's out there, but for investors, there's really not much. And I, I think there's a very good reason for that. We've seen in the past that first home, buy, uh, first home buyers grants only tend to um, add to the price um, of the grant, really. So um, while it gets some action, I don't think it's something the government will use any time soon, but you never know. Um, we'll wait and see. So grants are probably much much help to you unless you're a first home buyer where you can take advantage of that 5% depo deposit that Nerida mentioned earlier. Um, secondly, costs of conveyancing. I'd say not enough, you'd say too much. Um, the reality is it varies depending on what you're buying, um, depending on the conveyancer you use. But I suggest you guys and, and your loan broker and banker will um, suggest a, an amount when they're doing your calculations, but allow up to, to 2000 for your conveyancing fees. Now, don't panic, that doesn't all come to me. Um, there is other fees like Lands Titles Office registration fees, PECSA, which is a digital settlement platform, uh, etc. So, um, 
allow for a couple of thousand and you should get some change in your pocket all going well. Now the other thing when buying, and if you're looking at buying, and I'm sure most of you here have bought previously, um, you know that there's a very long list of um, fees that you've got to come up with, worsely stamp duty, um, there's also land titles office registration fees, there's adjustments of rates and taxes, there's obviously your insurance you've got to take out, there's inspection fees, search fees, bank fees, removalist fees if you're moving into the property, lender's mortgage insurance if you're borrowing a certain amount of money um, and that's needed, utility connection fees, etc. Uh, the list is long, especially when buying. But where people sometimes get caught is if you're selling and looking at selling is not having an understanding of the selling costs involved. So when you're selling, and there's obviously agent's commission, which is very well deserved, Talia, um, marketing expenses for the agent, agent admin fee for documentation, search costs for Form 1s, uh, payout of the current mortgage, obviously you need to pay out your mortgage um, for the property you're selling, and adjustment rates and, taxes, uh, rates and taxes, and of course removalist fees if you're moving out. So... As I said before, it, your loan broker or banker, when you're buying, should um, put into your calculations of the amount you need um, all of these um, bits and pieces. But if you're not sure um, when you're selling, especially, um, come and speak to to us or your conveyancer about the fees involved because we can give you a, a really clear rundown of what you should expect fees wise because um, we don't want to get caught out and we have had this situation quite a few times where uh, the client ends up with a lot less than they're expecting when they did their initial calculations because they hadn't taken into account all of the fees. Okay, I thought it was worth talking about subdivisions because some of you might be looking at how to um, I guess grow your equity in the property by potentially splitting off the backyard if you've got a big block or, or knocking house over and um, subdividing into two. Um, we're seeing a lot of that in Adelaide, especially the inner suburbs of Adelaide, um, and I think we'll see more and more of that um, in in regional areas as well. Uh, unfortunately, the building cost is probably one thing holding that back, um, but hopefully when that normalises to some extent, we might see a bit more of that. Subdivision costs can vary um, substantially, so it depends on whether it's rural land, commercial land or residential land. It depends on what property you're wanting to create, whether it's a Torrens title or community title. I won't go into the difference of those now. Um, speak to us afterwards if you're wanting, to, uh, wanting a rundown on that. Um, um, we suggest you speak to a surveyor if you're considering um, uh, chopping up your block or doing a division, speak to a surveyor. If you're not sure or don't have a surveyor that you know, come and speak to us. We can um, suggest a surveyor for you. But they're the ones that handle the bulk of the process. They handle the approvals, etc. Uh, as a conveyancer, we're right at the end of the process. So we handle the creation of the new titles, etc. The surveyor does all the approval uh, side of it. In regards to time frame, um, I mentioned timing there. Unfortunately, that's some, sometimes how long a piece of string. If SA Water isn't involved and if your council's helpful, um, it can be no more than six months, hopefully, three to six months. But most divisions we're seeing now from when you start speaking to your surveyor till the end can be 12 months, can be even longer. So speak to your surveyor as soon as possible. Don't expect to turn your, sir, your um, subdivision of your property around in three months. I know some people come to me and say, oh, I'm looking at selling these properties in three months um, and I'm subdividing. I said, well, hang on, you need to reconsider that and have a chat to the surveyor and make sure um, you've got a plan of attack. Stamp duty and establishment fees, I've probably touched on them uh, before. There's, um, when you're buying, as I said before, there is a, a hell of a long list, um, but speak to your loan broker or banker. If not, speak to us. The, thing, the important thing to know about stamp duty is that the, the more that you pay, the value in the dollar of stamp duty you pay go increases the more that you pay, if that makes any sense. So the more amount of money that you pay, the higher in the dollar that stamp duty. So you can't just allow, allow for 5%. I know I have clients ring me and say, oh, should I allow 5%, Brad? It's like, well, go onto our website, or I'll go onto our website, find the stamp duty calculator, and we'll um, provide those fees for you. Um, title insurance is something that you guys might not be aware of and it's something that we offer all of our clients and I know many of our uh, conveyancer friends um, are doing that now. We think it's a really important product. So to be really clear, it's not property insurance, it's not contents insurance. They call it title insurance which in some respects um, may be a bit misleading. Um, 
it's a one-off premium that you pay when you buy the property. You can also take it out if you're an existing property owner, but the most most times we see it, it's where someone's buying and we offer it to them where they're buying. So it's a one-off premium that covers you for the lifetime that you own the property. So one-off premium for the lifetime and it covers things like buildings um, that haven't got approval, that might be erected without approval, that you might need to pull down, change, the council finds out that you didn't get approval for uh, making the back garage to a fourth bedroom, which we see a bit of that. Um, so it covers you in situations like that. It also covers boundary issues. So where you buy a property and after you bought the property, your neighbour um, uh, says to you over the fence, oh, by the way, that half a metre there is my land. So and, we, and I want you to move the fence and it's going to cost you $5,000, etc. So Bound, we've, we believe strongly in um, our clients taking out title insurance. We've seen it claimed on a lot. I know I have clients challenging me and say, oh, Brad, you know, no one ever claims on this. I said, I'm sorry, I can show you numerous occasions where it has. We've had a large claim that was uh, covered. It was about $95,000 of renovations that was done to this property without approval uh, that our client bought. Unbeknownst to them, it wasn't approved and they had to make substantial changes up to ninety five five thousand dollars of changes and title insurance covered it for a one-off premium of six hundred and eighty dollars I think it was at the time so please strongly consider title insurance if you got a conveyance or if it's not us and they don't offer it ask for it um, I strongly encourage you to do that so that's pretty much me flown through it I'm going to do a bit of a um, plug while I'm up here um, so we've got 10 offices across the state we've also got Eckerman lawyers to, to back us up if we need um, we're located in Mount Gambia at uh, 3 Panola Road we just recently moved there into the old trustee building um, also we've got a, a service called Eckerman Assist where you can contact us after hours so we're available 7am uh, to 9pm Monday to Friday and 9am to 5pm weekends and public holidays so if you've got a question question after hours. If you're not sure, um, if you're making an offer, if you're going to an open inspection on a weekend and you want to know a question, of, you know, want to know something about an easement or an encumbrance or something like that that the agent can't help you with for whatever reason, please use that. You don't have to be an existing client. You don't have to be a past client. Um, reach out to us. Um, uh, during the break, please come and grab. We've got some flyers with Eckerman Assist with our phone number on there. Um, other than that, I think that's all. Um, I've mentioned Eckerman Watch, Eckerman Watch there, which is a title observation service that we provide as well uh, to make sure that if any, if there's any activity on your title after you've purchased it, we'll let you know if there's any activity. So it's just a bit of a um, uh, I guess making you feel more comfortable that these days you don't get the physical paper title that you used to previously so um, there's a digital title so the best way to to know whether there's any issues or fraud happening with that title is for us to um, we call it Eckerman Watch or Title Watch um, so yeah that's it for me I again um, thank you very much Talia for the opportunity um, and hope you enjoy the rest of the night thanks Thank you, Brad. Next up, we have an expert with over 20 years experience. He'll be explaining everything you need to know about depreciation to ensure you maximise the cash flow from your investment property. You can trust BMT to find the highest amount of depreciation deductions for your investment. Please welcome Nathan Frost. Thank you, excellent. Uh, just before I get, Nathan, hello everybody. Just before I get started, a um, couple of things. I know my mother-in-law told me it's a reunion of farmers once a wife, so good on you for coming out here tonight instead of staying home. It's so much easier to stay home and not learn about this sort of stuff, but this sort of stuff is amazing knowledge um, to help you get confidence to build your portfolio, get into the market. Uh, I have people coming up to me, and I'm sure anyone in real estate does, saying, how expensive is property at the moment? It's too expensive. I don't want to take a risk on I don't sell real estate, by the way. I do depreciation. I'll get into my stuff in a minute. Um, but I sort of look at it like my parents bought their property when it was, I think, $25,000. And they thought that was expensive at the time. Every, almost everyone I speak to thinks their property is expensive at the time they bought it. It's only in hindsight when you look back that it doesn't seem so expensive. And 
And, um, and my parents are of the generation where they just got told, pay off your mortgage and happy days, you'll live happily ever after, and they're on the pension. Hasn't worked for them, so they encouraged me and my brother to do something different, which is, for me, is property business for him. Um, I think, you know, the, most Australians probably think the cross lottery is their retirement plan, and I don't know how many people that's working out for. Um, secondly, I, I, I've done quite a few of these sort of things with real estate agents over many, many, many years, and this is an incredible show what your office has put on today. Ray, Ray White, like, honestly, this is crazy what you guys have done, and well done for backing up your team, the, the Ray White team here. Uh, so I'm primarily on the road. I go to everyone's investment properties. I've been to 20,000 properties over the last 17, 18 years. I uh, see all sorts of things, um, and I just love my job. I love getting around, around and about. Let's get through some depreciation stuff. Otherwise, if my boss is watching this video, he's probably not really impressed so far. So, depreciation, a lot of people think of it as, oh, I mean, the basic way of I look at it is it's just like a tradie claiming wear and tear on their car and their tools. A lot of people are familiar with that, you know, that theory. And it's the same with an investment property. In fact, every property wears out over time, but if it's an investment property, the tax office lets you claim that wear and tear as a tax deduction and pay less tax. So we go out to the property, we measure everything, we count everything, what's, how much, uh, the volume of carpet, volume of vinyl, volume of tiles, what sort of blinds you have, what sort of light fittings you have, garage door motors, how big your bigola is, all that type of stuff. Then we write the report up, which is a once off. So our clients don't come back to us ever again for one, each, each property. They'll only come back to us if they add to their portfolio. We go to the property once, we write the report up, we give it to your accountant, the accountant uses it every financial year as part of your tax return and you pay a heap less tax. Pretty much, sound good? Yeah. We're all breathing, that means we all wanna pay less tax. It's cash flow, pretty much. Cash, we all heard, we've all heard the term, cash flow is king or queen these days, I guess. Um, everything's wearing out in your house. You can claim a tax deduction in relation to that wear and tear. So I'm gonna have to flick around and see what's... A lot of people think their accountants do the depreciation schedule. It's not true. We're quantity surveyors and the legislation says it has to be a quantity surveyor to estimate historical construction costs for depreciation purposes. I know that's a mouthful, uh, but the reality is most of our work comes from accountants selling their clients to come to us. Accountants bring their own investment properties to us. I've met so many people from the tax office bringing their properties to us to do their depreciation schedules. I mean, we could all, you can do whatever you want to get audited probably. <laughs> But if you want to make sure that it's all legit, one, we'll make sure we can get the most back for you as a tax deduction. And secondly, we, we've never failed an audit. We've never ever failed an audit from the tax office. And part of our service, if you get audited by the tax office, is to justify our costings on your behalf. So in 25, 27 years, we've never failed an audit. It's a pretty good achievement. So this will give you a bit of an idea as to what sort of numbers we can expect. Uh, on, a, on, the, on this example, new three bedroom house, $690,000. I mean, I guess the market's moved so quick that th these numbers probably get outdated pretty quick, but for this example, just bear with it. 690,000, 560 a week rent, 29,000 a year income, 38,000 expenses, primarily uh, yeah, interest on your mortgage, uh, but a whole lot of other expenses as well. So before you do your tax return, that's going to cost that investor $187 a week to own that property. So that's, that's the whole scenario down the left-hand side there, exactly what we just talked about. So once you've done your tax return, though, based on the refund of 37%, you get a $3,601 refund, or it's come down to $118 a week to own your property for that one. But on the right-hand side now, which I'll put up a bit prematurely, we've got the... Um, where we factor in depreciation. So you've got your income, whole lot of expenses, total loss before depreciation is 9733 And then we've found out there's $15,800 worth of depreciation on that property for that financial year, which is actually taking your total tax deduction up to 25533 now. So then your accountant does your tax return. Based on that refund of 37%, you get a 9447 refund or it's come down to $5 a week to own that property. So we've probably all heard those ads, or certainly I know in a lot of the capital cities, you know, if you can give up one coffee a week, you can own an investment property. They are always taking into account depreciation with their scenarios. I've seen it because I've done presentations for those groups a lot of the time. $113 a week difference, that's 
that's maybe that might add another property to your portfolio or, or, or make you comfortable, you know? It's a heap, it's a big difference. Is everyone all right with that? Have I explained that okay? Yep, cool. I'm also up the back there, so if you have any questions about specific properties, just come up and speak to me at the end. There's two uh, components to your overall depreciation. There's a write-off against the structure and there's a write-off against the fixtures and fittings. Uh, basically, as long as your property, I don't want people to get caught up on this too much because every property is different. But as a general rule, any property built after September 1987 is worthwhile getting a depreciation schedule on. So we charge uh, $770 for the depreciation schedule. That's a full tax deduction. It's a once off, you don't do it ever again. But we won't charge that unless we can guarantee at least double that back in the first full financial year. So we're only gonna do it when we know it's worth your money and your time and effort. And all the fixtures and fittings, dishwashers, ovens, garage door motors, smoke alarms, down lights, pendant lights, garden irrigation, synthetic grass, all that type of stuff. Commercial properties also attract significant depreciation. They're all on a, um, they're all different. They're all case by case. If you have commercial properties and you have any um, questions about it, feel free to, to come up and speak to me at the end. I won't go into the commercial too much now. So by far the most frequently asked questions we get. Doesn't my accountant look after that? They shouldn't be, and most of them don't. Some, in saying that, once you've got your depreciation schedule, if you make some minor changes to your property, you don't have to contact us every single time. You might just put um, a new split system air conditioner in. You can just tell your accountant what, that, what you've done, when you've done it, and they can just balance the schedule according to whatever your changes are. If you do wholesale changes to the property, that's different. That might be a case where we'll come out again for the second time. Isn't the property too old? You know what, like, it's, it's not too old to at least get peace of mind to know that you've done everything you can. The amount of people over the years I've heard say to me, oh, my mate told me it was too old and I haven't worried about getting it done. And then we've actually gone ahead and done it because they've had uh, different advice and, and we've worked out that they've lost so much money, it's unbelievable. The good news is they can go back up to the previous two years and amend those tax returns based on what our schedule says. So if people in the room have got investment properties that you haven't got a depreciation schedule on, it's worth, you know, don't, don't just think, oh, it's too late for me. Find out. Renovations, if you go and buy a, uh, a, a property and it's new to you, but the previous owner has renovated it, you get the benefit of those costings. So we'll go out there to the property, we'll do our detailing. If we see a, uh, a lavender bathroom, we know that's original. So you're not gonna get any benefit on that one. But if we can see that it's no more modern grey, you know, all the modern colour, anyone can walk into a house and know if it's been renovated. But just because you didn't do it doesn't mean you don't get the benefit of the depreciation you do. Is it ever too late to claim? That's pretty much what I covered off before. It's not too late to claim. Even if you had the property for 10, 15 years, it's not too late to claim. You can still claim. And we've got that guarantee in place to, so that you're confident that your, your money's well spent. So we've got our online portal. It's sort of our one-stop shop for everything depreciation. I've got that on the, on the iPad at the back if anyone wants to come and have a look at it. Um, but once you've got your depreciation schedule, you can do a whole lot of things on the portal. Uh, you can put your income and expenses in, upload your photos and receipts. We can share it, you can share it with your accountant directly. Um, one of the other things we do is we link it to planning applications as well. So depending on what area you're in, you might get a lot of alerts saying like your neighbour's about to put up a pergola or whatever or a subdivision. Uh, but depending on if you're in some areas that you can be in that you just get too many alerts, so you need to, you need to switch it off. There's some, I'm from Adelaide uh, and just, there's some suburbs which have so much infill and subdivisions that the alerts just come through a bit too frequently. Prop calc, so this is a really, really good app we've got. Uh, it basically can give you, you can be looking at, uh, I don't know, however you find your properties on, online, the Ray White website preferably, right? Um, plug in all the details, what you think the rent's gonna be, what you think the interest rate's gonna be, all the expenses, all the income, and then it comes back with a true cost at the end for that property. So it's, it's, it's just, it's an amazing app if you wanna know what sort of figures are gonna be, you know, in relation to the properties, or the various properties, you can do them side by side and compare them as well. 
So how do we make it easy? It's, it is pretty simple. Basically, as soon as you get onto our website, or you should, if, you, if you're contacting us, make sure you drop the Ray White name. Make sure you've, you've heard it here. Because I th we got a, there's a discounted fee, isn't there? Pretty sure, yeah. So normally 770, but with Ray White, it's 715. So make sure you say that's who sent you to BMT so you can get that discount. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. The guys in the office, guys and girls in the office, when they take your call, they'll always ask some questions. Where is your property? What's the address? They'll already be looking it up. They'll ask some questions to make sure that it's feasible, that we, you know, it's worth your time and money. We can come through the guarantee. With the guarantee, we normally know after a few questions on the phone whether, yes, you should go ahead with it or you shouldn't. Even if, you, if we're still in doubt, we'll normally still go to the property, see how it all balances out and let you know. We're only ever going to do it for you when it's worth, it's worth it. And that report, so if you, go, if you buy a brand new property today or this year, the report will go for four decades. Four decades. Could be two, three hundred thousand dollars worth of depreciation over that, that, that period. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it for me. If you have any, are we going to come, we're coming back up for questions later? Yep. If you have anything that you don't really want to raise in front of the group, come and see us at the back, um, ask some questions. Uh, but I just want to reiterate like how good it is to see everyone come to these sort of things. It's so much easier to stay home, it really is. But the ones staying home aren't getting this amazing session and all this great education. You've got to start somewhere. It's never easy to make money, so you've just got to put in the effort. There's no substitute for putting in the effort, pretty much. Um, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a good night and uh, come and see us at the back. Thank you, Nathan. Next up is the Property Management Business Development Executive for Ray White, South Australia and Northern Territory. He commenced his career in 2009 and has a continuing hands-on experience in providing professional supervision, leadership, operational management and planning within the real estate industry. Please give a warm welcome to Chris Tepper. Hi everyone, um, thank you for that introduction. My, uh, my title is one of the longest I've ever seen and it is a pain in the ass to get out on the phone. Um, basically, I'm just going to talk to everyone today about just a little bit about the history of Ray Wyatt. Um, so Ray Wyatt was founded in 1902 and it was actually founded in that little tin shed up in regional Queensland. Um, Ray is actually a, was a person, so Ray Wyatt founded it um, and then we've then got uh, Alan, who was his son, and then we've got Brian, who's on the left, uh, and um, Dan, who is now the managing director, who is um, Ray White's great-grandson. So it's still a family business, and I think um, a lot of the, the, you know, the values and you know, what, what Ray White bring um, definitely show through that family um, generation hand down. So Ray White as a group, so what we've got, you know, we're not just sales and property management. We've also got one of the largest um, mortgage broking um, companies in Australia as well. And we also invest millions of dollars into tech. So Ray White built a lot of their own tech, which is quite unique for a real estate company. Um, means that we've got a lot of control and we can actually put customer feedback directly into the tech that we build, which is really cool. So Ray White, from that little tin shed in regional Queensland, uh, we've now got over a thousand offices across the globe, which I think is really cool. A lot of it is based here in Australia, but obviously we have branched out um, you know, throughout the world. Here in SA, so we've got 61 offers currently uh, split between metro and regional. Uh, we're actually soon to be 63 offices, so we are growing, and I think that's part of the, the strength of the brand that we are, you know, we're growing. Um, and we obviously have a lot to offer in terms of, you know, the support and the network. This is our uh, state team. So for all of the sales agents and the property managers and the admin staff out in, um, in our network, you know, we've got a corporate team that we support. So just like I specialize in property management and supporting property managers in the network, um, we've got someone in each field. So we've got someone in sales, we've got someone in digital. So anyone throughout our, you know, throughout our network, if they need support, there's someone that specializes in obviously giving that support to them. 
Uh, like um, our state support, we've also got a national property management team. So this is the largest in Australia of professionals that support property managers. So that's you know that's something that not a lot of other networks can offer um, and being able to tap into that is something that you know I think is really beneficial then for the you know, the greater network and the property managers out there. So what exactly does obviously all of this mean for investors? So Ray White's got over 600 residential portfolios under management so what that means is obviously there's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of support that we have to provide to our network so we're always um, finding the best possible ways to do things, to train, to make sure that you know our network is as supported as it possibly can be. We've got over 220,000 residential properties under management. So what that means is there's a lot of collective experience. And as you saw in the previous slide, there's, I guess, one of me in every single state, which means we can share our collective experiences. If I don't know something, there's a big chance that someone else in another state has gone through it and I'm able to obviously get that collective experience, pass it to property managers who then pass it through to the service they offer investors. Um, last financial, it was last year, um, 22, we had over 40,000 new property management clients sign up throughout Australia. Um, and what that sort of goes to show is there is a you know, a proven level of service that we are trying to provide. And obviously we're always continuing to grow and, and try and better ourselves in that. So what does a property manager actually do? So depending on obviously what end of the, the rental um, property you sit, whether you're a tenant or a landlord, property managers basically facilitate the day-to-day -day operations for uh, a landlord and a tenant. Um, we are obviously employed by the landlord to manage their investment property. So you can see here, these are sort of the steps laid out throughout the journey. Obviously each one of these steps has a whole different range of tasks that sort of fall in into that. But I, you know, ideally in a perfect world, this is sort of how a journey looks for an investor um, and sort of what a property manager facilitates. So there's obviously a lot that goes into property management that is um, sort of behind the scenes. So a lot of people do sort of see, you know, or there's sort of a misconception out there that sort of all we do is collect rent and show properties. There's a lot that goes on in the back end that I guess a lot of people aren't privy to. Um, there's a lot of conversations, there's a lot of negotiating, and there's a lot of, I guess, paperwork that is involved in making sure that investors let properties, their tenancy are, are looked after properly. At the end of the day, the, the biggest, I guess, um, role that a property manager has, a good property manager has, is risk mitigation. So making sure that obviously the, the landlord's journey is a safe one. Um, obviously with uh, legislation, there can be a lot of grey areas, um, but I guess there's, there's no real um, compromise for experience. So having an experienced property manager with a lot of training is something that, you know, is going to make your investment journey a lot smoother and a lot better because at the end of the day, they can sort of forecast and they can see down the road what, you know, what may not be a problem today may be a problem in the future. And, and that's ideally what they're, they're there for to, to try and help you through, I guess, the gray areas that, you know, investing and tenancy management come with. <coughs> So Ray White Property Managers. So again, going back to sort of the start of the presentation was, you know, we, we have a huge support network. We've got a big corporate team and we're continuously trying to provide as much support and training for property managers as possible. Um, you know, the industry for a long time has lacked a lot of training for PMs. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people out there have had probably a negative experience when renting or through a property manager. Um, we acknowledge that. And at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to, to make those things right. We're trying to get people trained up. We're trying to improve the level of service that's offered out there. Oh. So we've obviously got, we, we, we fly in trainers, uh, we offer monthly training, we offer quarterly training, uh, we offer online training for our property managers. Um, being such a large network, it means that we're able to provide those services uh, to, to our property managers, to our administrators, to our leasing managers, um, to make sure that they are educated as, as much as that we possibly can get them educated. Um, we've got the online um, learning, which is actually written 
by property managers for property managers. A lot of the time, I mean, up until a few years ago, you didn't even have to be a licensed to be a property manager. You could just walk in off the street and manage someone's, you know, $500,000 investment. We finally got licensing here in SA. Um, but the licensing teaches you a little bit about legislation, but not, a, not much about things like risk mitigation, tenancy, uh, negotiation, all of those little things. So we've, we've put a lot of time and effort into making sure that our property managers do have access to a lot of that training. And lastly, I guess with, with Ray Wyatt touched on it at the very beginning, we are investing a lot of money into technology. One of the bits of technology that, um, so Ben White, who is one of the brothers, is had co-founded is a company called ALO. So ALO was sort of at the forefront of the new wave of property management technology. Basically, in short, it gives investors access to their rental money in real time. At the moment, the way that it works is generally you'll get paid once or twice a month. Um, they're generally like the end of month payment with a statement. ALO and the app that um, you know, the, the White family is bringing out allows you to see in real time when your tenant pays rent. And again, it's, it's industry leading. So we haven't had this type of visibility or investors or landlords haven't had this type of visibility before. Um, so that's something that's so in development. It's slowly going to roll out over the next few years. Um, and it's quite exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We'd now like to welcome um, our panels of speakers to the stage. So we've got uh, Max Bruins. Max is an exper experienced financial planner. His career including running both the Canberra and Sydney office for a large industrial super fund, specialising in retirement planning. Max is a partner in the local financing, financial planning firm, Galpin's Financial Solutions. He's also the deputy mayor of the city of Mayor Gambia. We also have Tegan Cull. Tegan um, has been in the broking industry since 2021, but brings with her over nine years of financial um, industry experience. We have one of our own, Alastair Coonan. He has been in the real estate industry since 2015 and joined the Ray White team in 2021. He comes from an experienced background in the customer service and retail management sector and takes great pride in delivering an exceptional experience for all of his clients. All right, so we're going to start with Max. Can you give us a brief oversight of some of the pros and cons of various ownership structures for people considering purchasing an investment property, i.e. buying an individual name, joint names or family trust? Yeah, thank you. So uh, basically on the financial planning side, one of the, the biggest issues we come across or biggest issues we see is people that have got investment properties that have gone in and bought them uh, in a certain ownership structure, not realising what the, the consequences of doing that are down the track. Um, so, for instance, there's, there's a whole range of different structures you can look at when buying an investment property. It might be owned individually, uh, might be owned jointly, either as joint tenants or tenants in common. Uh, it could be owned via family trust, uh, via a company or via a superannuation fund. And each of those ownership structures have kind of small idiosyncrasies that you may not be aware of going in, but can have a big impact on the, the tax consequences and things like that down the track. So, um, for instance, you, you might look at buying an investment property in an individual's name if they're a, a high income earner now uh, to get the, the tax deduction or the benefit in negative gearing um, with, without considering the consequences down the track of if that property is sold for a significant capital gain, um, that capital gain is also levied in that individual's name. So um, again, with say self-managed superannuation funds, a lot of people now, uh, if, it's, if it's difficult to get financing, might be looking to buy a, a residential property in their self-managed super fund, which is great if there's a large capital base there that you can use to buy the property. Um, but again, that also has implications down the track in terms of use of the property um, and things like that. So the, the biggest thing I can say here is do your homework before you sign the contract. So if you've, if you've gone down that path and you think that an investment property is right for you and you're going to progress down that, that route, pick up the phone and have a chat with someone and explore all of those options in terms of um, yeah, the, the differing things with all those ownership structures and get it right to start with. Thank you, Max. Tegan, can I use equity to buy an investment and how does it work? Uh, yes, you absolutely can. So when you've got an existing property and you've got equity available, we would look to do most commonly the investment property purchase through that same lender. So 
your properties and your loans are secured all together and you're basically accessing the equity you've got there. So you'll do a new loan and it's probably for the purchase price plus the buying costs, so your stamp duty transfers, all that sort of stuff. Often it's advised to maximise your debt against a investment. Um, you might want to talk to a, someone like Max or an accountant on that to confirm what's best for you, but yeah, that's essentially how we would look to do it. Uh, sometimes we'll do it at a different lender. It might be because your current lender won't take what you want to buy as a security. So we draw the equity out with a loan as a cash out essentially with your existing lender and then do a new loan with the new lender um, just as a standalone. So both of those loans will be um, treated the same as the sole investment loan. So you can still take the tax benefits and depreciation and all that kind of stuff. It's all still the same. It just looks a little bit different on paper. Thanks, Tegan. Alistair, yep. what are the key features that investors are usually looking for in a purchase aside from price? Um, so the obvious ones like number of bedrooms and bathrooms tends to be a pretty key factor in what the weekly rental potential of a property might be. Uh, and every investor might have a different, uh, I suppose, expected return on investment that they're seeking depending on their individual scenario. Uh, but some other factors outside of that, such as uh, shedding, a pretty common one at the moment from a lot of interstate investors is land size. Um, I think to Brad's point earlier, as far as potential subdivision, um, it's something that a lot of people are thinking about what might I be able to use the land for in say 10 or 15 or 20 years or maybe not even what they would use it for but what the next purchaser might be seeking within within that so um, yeah what we're finding at the moment is a lot of people will be querying what's the land size and what's the minimum land size that we could potentially divide to um, and then other things like in South Australia we can still potentially benefit from um, you know whether you're allowing pets in a property and that kind of thing um, so secure yards uh, and a a yard for uh, pets or for a large family, that kind of thing can all be contributing as well. Thanks, Ellie. Max, back to you. What are some common oversights people may make when choosing an ownership structure? Uh, not to get too more, but this early in the week, but estate planning is a big one that has um, serious implications that people don't often think about. Um, if you're buying a property in an individual's name, um, they pass away, that can get caught in probate. So if you're looking to dispose of that, you might uh, have to wait a, a serious amount of time before that can happen when probate's granted. Um, with buying a property jointly, if it's owned as joint tenants, if someone passes away, the property automatically goes to the surviving um, co-owner. So from an estate planning perspective, that can actually be beneficial with blended families and things like that. If you don't want sort of challenges on an estate to come around, you can ensure that property transitions as you wish. Um, and the other thing with estate planning is in terms of if you buy in a trust or a company or a super fund, if someone passes away, that asset doesn't automatically become part of the estate. So it retains it's still owned by that structure um, and you've got to will the, the control of that structure um, to, to do that. So that's, that's certainly a big one. Um, and if you're dealing with self-managed superannuation funds, one of the other things that people quite often overlook is the ability to use the property yourself or that, that future proofing. So um, big thing I've come across lately is people, if they've got kids moving to Adelaide or Melbourne for university, they think, oh yeah, we'll use the super fund buy an investment property now and the kids can use it later on, but that then breaches the sole purpose test because if it's a, a residential property, you can't gain a personal benefit from that um, while it's owned by your superannuation fund. So just all those other sort of small tips and traps are, are things we have to consider. Yep. Thank you. Tegan, can I afford an investment property? Well, the answer to this question obviously differs for each individual or couple or whatever structure we're looking at for the purchase. So uh, I guess to put it, a simple way, if it's just individuals, we're solely looking at your personal income. So whether that's PAYG, you work for someone else or you work for yourself, so self-employed income. We'll consider any rental income that you already have or the proposed rental income that you will receive from the property. Um, and obviously any other income if you get dividends and that sort of stuff. But then on the flip side of that, we also have to consider the increase in expenses that you'll have. So you'll have another set of rates, you'll have insurance, um, maintenance costs, property management costs, obviously. Uh, then depending on the type of property, you'll have strata fees or body corporate fees. That's another chunky cost that a lot of people don't consider. Um, and yeah, so we take all of that into consideration when working out if somebody can or can't afford a investment. Thank you. Ali, how much rent return should I be getting compared to my property value? 
Um, depends a bit on the property value itself, but that's probably been one of the biggest shifts in our market here locally over the last 12 to 18 months, in particular where uh, a lot of investors from outside of the area have been buying in uh, probably with a, a lower ROI expectation from the markets they might have been coming from in the past. As a general rule of thumb, uh, most investors that we're speaking with at the moment for a standalone property are probably looking between 55 to 6% uh, ROI. So that's your obviously rental income in versus um, what the property value on paper is. And, and in turn, that's what's seen a big push in the lower end of the market increasing in value because as people are, are willing to take that lower ROI, um, it's, it's pushed the top-end purchase price up. So, yeah, roughly 55 to 6% is where we're seeing a lot of interest at the moment from a lot of those investors. Differs a little bit for um, units or strata, and once you get higher up in that property value, it, it does tend to scale a little bit. So. Thanks, Sally. Max, what are your thoughts on shared fund versus an investment property? Yeah, so as a financial planner, we hear sort of the, the good news stories and the horror stories on both sides of the fence. And as I always say, there's lies, damn lies and statistics. And you can, you can manipulate the figures or, or in, in basically any way you like to sort of show one is better than the other. Um, the key is just basically assessing what's best for your personal circumstances. Um, I'm, I'm always going to push diversification. Um, so, so a little bit of both doesn't hurt. Um, but from that, yeah, in, in that side of things, it's just it's do your homework. So um, one, one key, I guess, in terms of an investment property where it, where it can be more suitable for most is that in that discipline. Um, so, so some people come to me and say, yep, look, we've got this much in excess or surplus cash flow. We want to do a savings plan. Um, they, they may sort of anticipate going into shares and managed funds with that and they're not the, the money because it's not forcing they're not forced to pay off a mortgage basically um, they're a bit more flippant with that whereas at least with the the investment side of things if they're, they're disciplined they've got that mortgage payment they have to meet it every month um, that may be more suitable um, for a lot of people going down that path thanks max tegan are investment loans interest only what is interest only so i'll take the second part of that question first so interest only is exactly as it sounds you only pay the interest on your loan so say for example you have a $250,000 loan interest only if your term is five years in five years time you still owe $250,000 so you're not actually uh, building equity yourself into the property you're relying solely essentially on capital growth for that to happen um, so not all investment loans have to be interest only um, this is probably leads in very well to Max and uh, working out the structure that's going to be best for you so it might um, depend on the type of entity that you're purchasing the property but also what your goal is with that property so are you looking to build a lot of wealth over a long period of time or do you have a really short-term goal uh, perhaps you're buying somewhere that's a really high growth and it's just a short-term thing that you're wanting to just take advantage of that growth and then get out so all of those things will piece together and help me work out with you what sort of loan is going to actually work best to meet that strategy. So that sometimes is going to be interest only, but sometimes not. Thanks, Tegan. Ali, is there a most common price point or type of property that investors are usually looking for in the Mount Gambia area? Yeah, at the moment, we're still seeing quite a lot of interest between three to 400000 uh, as a price bracket. Uh, over the last 12, 12 months, um, that's definitely been uh, a hot segment of the market that has still been pretty undersupplied as far as the amount of demand that we're getting. Um, it's no denying that it's kind of plateaued out a little bit over the last few months, um, but we have still been getting some very consistent inquiry on anything that's listed within that kind of price range. Um, and a, a lot of people that are calling up weekly saying, hey, have you got any off-market opportunities that are under 400,000? That seems to be the, the sweet spot at the moment. That's not to say that there aren't investors in the higher end of the market above that, um, but yeah, certainly the, the bulk of the inquiry we're getting at the moment is in that kind of price range from investors. Thanks, Ellie. Last one, Max. Are there any major things that need to be considered in choosing whether to buy a residential or a commercial investment property? Yeah, so uh, I guess a lot of the conversations this evening have focused on residential properties, but um, yeah, commercial properties are definitely a beast that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, I said there's there's a, a I guess a risk versus return is the uh, the first thing to consider. So Ali touched on the the rate of return on a residential property. The rate of return on a commercial property is typically higher than that, um, but again, so is the risk because you've got specialised properties and and specialised tenants that can go into those. Um, 
one thing that we do need to consider with with res residential, I guess, is that there's a um, there's no stamp duty to get into uh, commercial properties here in SA. So there's the um, the stamp duty cost that Brad alluded to earlier doesn't apply on on commercial properties there. So there's a, I guess a lower lower cost to entry um, in that regard, um, and also a little bit of flexibility. So if there's any sort of small business people in the room, if you if you own a commercial property in your own name, and then maybe want to subsequently down the track transfer that into a, a self-managed super fund or, or vice versa with a commercial property you can or you're allowed to actually transfer property that you own from your own name into your own superannuation fund uh, whereas you can't do that with residential property you can only buy a, a property from an arm's length um, so yeah those things are certainly something to consider and, and may put commercial in a better light for some people yeah thanks max tegan can i finance a short-term rental uh, in short, yes, you can. Um, the key thing to remember with your short-term rentals, so your, this is typically your Airbnb and holiday homes, that sort of thing. Uh, so long as the property is acceptable to the lender to take as security, unless you've got something else to offer up, that's fine. Um, but often the rental return that you get is shaded heavily. So um, the lender will only consider a far reduced amount of what you're actually getting. Um, because of the, I guess, the volatility of that market. You, you don't have the consistency of a long-term rent where you get your $350 every week. Um, you might just have nothing for two months and then you, you're flat out, but you're getting a really high rate every day for that. So there are different considerations as far as um, what, that, what you get in as a return factor in terms of what that looks like when we're working out servicing, if you need that income to assist with that servicing. Um, but yes, it's definitely a doable thing. Thanks, Tegan. Ali, what improvements might add the most value to my investment? Mm. Um, obvious ones like new kitchens, bathrooms, that kind of thing can definitely have an impact, but at the moment, waiting on trays to do that can be a pretty tricky thing and um, only getting costlier in some regards too. Um, I touched on it earlier, things like shedding, secure yards, et cetera, anything that can help to perhaps bump that rent up by you know, 10 or $15 a week can have a, a great return at the outcome if, if your goal, I suppose, is to have a property that's going to grow in value over time. Um, simple things like you know, making sure your gutters are cleaned and, and keeping um, you know, the, the eaves in check and little, little bits of maintenance like that, that when it does come time to sell, uh, and the vast majority of investors now are getting your building and pest inspections done and, and coming back to us and saying, well, we don't want to have to go and spend the money on that maintenance, so either you know, we'll renegotiate on that agreed price or they might have an expectation that the owner um, will, will get those issues rectified and, and it's something that a little bit of maintenance along the way can definitely protect that investment long term um, so that you do reap the benefit of it down the track. Well, please give a round of applause for our expert panel here tonight. The audience will now have the opportunity to ask um, any of our experts any questions. So I'll invite our other experts if you guys just want to stay around yeah. just in case. Um, does any of the, um, anyone here got any questions? Oh, we've got one down here. Do you want to? We can probably hear you. Hi Max, in the current economic climate at the moment, would you advise uh, to, um, to buy and live in or rent? It's two individual problems. In Mount Gambia, <laughs> two individual. Yeah, basically I get scun under the uh, general advice warning here and have to uh, plead the fifth, basically. Yeah. It's, it's individual circumstances that in, that, in that regard. I said that you've got to look, there's so many factors um, that, that come into play with that. Um, they said more than happy to have a chat with anyone offline and sort of go more in depth in the in individual personal circumstances, but to make a, a broad arching statement like that, I'll be in handcuffs tomorrow, so. <laughs> anyone else? Up the back here. Sorry, Max. Sorry, Max, you're very popular. I'm gonna throw one at you again. Uh, if you're selling an investment property through Ray White, for example, when should you be signing the contract considering capital gains uh, on that property? Because the contract date's pretty important. 
Correct, yeah, and it said particularly this time of year coming into sort of June, July with the uh, the cusp of the financial year. So capital gains tax is always levied on the date that the contract is signed, not the date that you settle. So uh, a lot of people get scunned with that with basically, come, said coming up to 30 June, they'll sign a contract thinking that, yeah, that yep, I'll put a 30-day 30, 30 settlement or, or settle in July um, and not realising that the, when the, the calculations for tax are done, it's on the date that the contract is signed. So that's something to be absolutely yeah, cognitive of and, and is really crucial. Um, I guess flowing on from that too, some people will always or can also look to make contributions, tax deductible contributions into superannuation to offset that capital gain. Um, so you've got to be aware of when that property settles and when you're going to have the cash to do so. And again, particularly with properties um, sort of selling around this time of year, that if you sign a contract and you'd, you'd plan to use some of the proceeds to put into superannuation to offset that tax, you may not have that cash from the settlement to do so. So yeah, certainly give that some consideration. Thank you, Max. Anyone else got any questions? Everyone's a bit shy. No one else? Okay, well that concludes this evening's formalities. The entire Ray White Matt Gambier team would like to take this time to thank all our guest speakers. We also like to thank our stall holders and industry professionals who have joined us here tonight. If you haven't already, please go check them out before you leave. A special thank you to our principal, Talia Gabrielli, who facilitated this event and allowed us to provide this opportunity to you all. I would like to thank the entire Ray White Met Gambia team for all their help towards this evening. We hope you have taken something from tonight, whether it be some new information, a new connection you have made. Our team will be sticking around here, so please come and see if you have any questions, whether it be property management or sales. We're always here to help. As Benjamin Franklin once said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Thank you all for attending. It's been an honour being your host. Good evening. Thank you.